I'm Anthony Davies, and this is Six Inconvenient Facts About the Federal Fisc. Inconvenient fact number one, the rich pay more taxes than anyone else. Consider a person who earns $50,000 a year, some of it from wages, some of it from interest on savings, some of it from return on investments. The government taxes this person $5,000, and that's all federal taxes combined income taxes, payroll taxes, capital gains, all of it. Also, the federal government issues transfers to this person, totaling $6,000. A transfer is money the government gives to a person in exchange for nothing. Typically, these are the earned income tax credit, social insurance benefits like social security retirement income, income assistance, and all the various things we classify as welfare. So the question is, what is this person's effective federal tax rate? That is, of all the income the person earned, what fraction of that income did the person pay to the IRS? Now, the Congressional Budget Office constructs estimates of effective tax rates for Americans according to income level. And the way the CBO goes about doing this is it combines the person's market income, that is, the income he's earned from working from interest on savings, from capital gains, all these sorts of things that come from market activities, with the transfers the person has received from the federal government. So from the CBO's perspective, this person's income is $56,000. The government taxed this person $5,000. So we do the math, 5,000 divided by 56,000 is 9%. According to the Congressional Budget Office, this person's effective federal tax rate is 9%. Now, the problem with this is that calculation blurs the distinction between money a person earns as a result of market activities and money the government gives to the person. If we break those two things apart and call the person's income simply what the person earns as a result of market activities, and we call that $6,000 in transfers a negative tax, because in essence, that's what it is. Instead of the government stepping in and taking money from the person, the government is stepping in and giving money to the person. If we classify the numbers in that way, notice what happens. The person earns $50,000. The government taxes the person $5,000 and then returns to the person $6,000, resulting in a net tax of negative $1,000. So when all the dust settles, the person paid negative $1,000 in taxes on $50,000 of income, or the person's average effective federal tax rate is negative 2%. So here we have this odd situation where, depending on whether we classify transfers as income or as negative taxes, we get two markedly different answers as to how much tax this person is actually paying. Now, if we take the CBO's method counting transfers from the government as income, not as negative taxes. And we ask the question, what's the average effective tax rate for the poorest 20% of Americans, the middle 20%, the top 1%? We get numbers like this. And notice something interesting here. The story that we hear repeated is that the poor and the middle class pay more taxes than the rich. That's clearly not so. Using Congressional Budget Office numbers, we see that the average household amongst the poorest 20% pays an average of about 3% in federal taxes. And remember, this is all federal taxes combined, income taxes, payroll taxes, capital gains taxes, all of it. Middle income Americans pay an average federal tax rate of about 13%, and the top 1% pay an average federal rate of 34%. So using just the CBO numbers, we see that clearly the richer is an American household, the greater the average effective tax rate this household pays. Now, if instead we classify those transfers not as income, but as negative tax, which many economists will say is a more accurate categorization, what we find is disturbing. The poorest 20% of households actually pay an effective federal tax rate of negative 56%. That is, when all the dust settles, after the government has taken money from them and given money back, the average household amongst the poorest 
ends up 56% better off than before the government stepped in. The average middle class household pays an effective federal tax rate of negative 15%, and the top 1% pays 34%, the same as we found with the CBO calculations. And notice something interesting here. Putting aside the fourth quartile that's paying basically zero, around 3%, really it's the top 20% of households that are net payers to the federal government. So when we hear complaints about tax cuts being tax cuts for the rich, this is why our tax system has become so progressive that virtually any federal tax cut is a tax cut for the rich, because on average, those are the only people who are net payers into the federal fisc. These numbers reveal another disturbing thing, and that is 60% of U.S. households are net recipients of federal money. That is, on average, they're receiving more money back from the federal government in the form of transfers than they paid in in federal taxes. And this becomes very disturbing when we realize that we have created a situation in which 60% of voters actually have a vested interest in the government expanding its taxing and spending because that 60% of voters are net beneficiaries of larger government. Inconvenient fact number two, corporations don't pay taxes, they collect taxes, and this makes them excellent political tools. When a corporation pays taxes to the government, the money to pay those taxes has to come from one of three places. Either it comes from the company's consumers in the form of higher prices, or it comes from the company's employees in the form of lesser wages, lesser benefits, or it comes from the company's stockholders in the form of lesser returns. But either way, when the government taxes the corporation, the money to pay for that tax comes from one or a combination of these three groups of people. The corporation itself is simply a pass-through. It's a tool that collects the taxes and passes them on to the government. And this creates a problem because it makes it very easy for politicians to campaign on a platform of raising corporate taxes. And what the average voter perceives when he hears the politician say this is that the politician is going to force companies to pay for things that voters want. And so voters happily vote for the politician, largely oblivious of the fact that when they do so, they're actually voting for the politician to raise taxes on them. The corporation is merely a tool the politician is using to do this. Inconvenient fact number three, the federal government is bankrupt. How much money does the federal government owe? What gets a lot of press are the official federal government borrowings of about $23 trillion. But that number does not count money that federal agencies and government-sponsored enterprises have borrowed, for which the government, that is the taxpayer, is ultimately responsible. That's another $8 trillion. And then those numbers ignore federal unfunded liabilities. Federal unfunded liabilities are payments the federal government has promised to current and future retirees, typically in the form of retirement benefits, of Medicare, Medicaid benefits, benefits that the government has promised, but which it does not and will not, under the current rules, have the money to pay. And that's after accounting for future payroll taxes that the government will collect. And that totals about $150 trillion. Add it all up, and total federal liabilities are around $180 trillion. This is money the federal government either directly owes or has promised and will not have the money to pay. Now, the federal government currently borrows at about 2.5% per year. And remember, that's given that interest rates are at a historically low level. Even at that remarkably low interest rate, the cost of servicing a $180 trillion debt is $4.5 trillion per year. That is, to simply cover the interest payments on what the federal government owes, it would have to set aside $4.5 trillion per year. But federal receipts, as of 2019, were $3.4 trillion. There's a $1.1 trillion shortfall. And that's before 
the $1.4 trillion in annual discretionary spending. Put those together, and the federal government is currently spending $2.5 trillion more per year than it can afford. And that leads us to inconvenient fact number four. The government will have no choice but to print money. Given that the federal government is spending $2.5 trillion more per year than it has, there are only five ways the government can proceed. One is to increase taxes by 75%. The other is to cut spending by 45%. A third is to increase borrowing by 150% per year. The fourth is to default on 60% of the government's liabilities. Or the government could print enough money to create about 20% inflation per year. Now, we've already seen that 60% of American households are net recipients of larger government. Because of that, we can expect tremendous political pressure pushing back against any attempt to increase taxes or to cut spending. Increasing borrowing doesn't solve the problem, it simply pushes it out into the future. Because every dollar that the government borrows today simply goes on top of the debt that it currently has. And that brings us to inconvenient fact number five. We will pay for Washington's spending spree with our savings. There are only two viable paths left open for the federal government. One is to default on 60% of its liabilities, and that would come largely in the form of reduced Social Security and Medicare benefits. Already, the Social Security Board of Trustees is saying that if Social Security is to remain solvent beyond its current 15-year window, it would have to reduce Social Security benefits by about 20%. This piece, I think, is inevitable. At some point over the next five to 10 years, we're going to start to hear politicians talking about cutting Social Security benefits. And they won't say that they're going to cut Social Security benefits because clearly that's a political non-starter. Instead, they will say things like the following. Many Americans benefit from having employer-funded 401k plans. And typically, those Americans are Americans who hold higher paying jobs that they have attained because they have college educations. And how did they get those college educations? Because the federal government underwrote their student loans. It's time for those Americans to give back. And the way they will give back is by foregoing in part or perhaps in total their social security benefits. No politician will use the word default. They'll say things like, we're going to make Social Security means tested. Or, Social Security was never designed to deal with higher income earners. It was designed to deal with the poorest Americans. But in fact, what the federal government will be doing is defaulting on promises it has made to Americans. The other path left open to the government is to print money. When the government prints money, it creates inflation. Inflation is a tax on savings. It is not the government reaching in and taking your physical dollar bills, but it is the government reaching in and taking the purchasing power of those dollar bills. And now we start to hear this already. MMT, modern monetary theory, was up until recently a piece of fringe thought in economics. It's gaining popularity simply because politicians are pointing to it as a viable way forward. But when you boil down MMT to its bare bones, what it is, is a recipe for the government to print money. And that brings us to inconvenient fact number six. Wealth and savings taxes are an end to private property. The underlying premise of our tax code has always been that the government only taxes the positive results of people's actions. When you choose to work, the government taxes your income. When you choose to purchase something, the government taxes its sale. When you choose to invest, the government taxes the gain that you earn. But holding savings is an inaction. It is precisely the decision not to do something with your money. And if the government can now turn its attention to taxing things you do not do, in addition to taxing things that you choose to do, we've reached a point at which nothing is off limits to the government. In effect, we have no private property. We simply hold assets until the government decides that it needs them. So what do we do in the face of this coming fiscal crash? The good news is our productive capacity remains. 
the factories we have, our workforce, our intelligence, our technology, none of those things disappear. The bad news is our long-term expectations are upended. And that means we must take steps to prepare for receiving less social insurance benefits than the government promises. We must be prepared for inflation to eat away our savings. And we must prepare for taxes on our savings and our property. And all of that spells the need for careful investment planning. While these three harms may be unavoidable, careful investment planning can mitigate the pain they cause. If you've enjoyed this, I highly recommend to you my weekly podcast, Words and Numbers, where I and my co-host, James Harrigan, discuss contemporary issues through the eyes of an economist and a political scientist. And now I'm happy to introduce Nathan Messero, with whom I recently interviewed on his podcast, Day in a Canoe. You can download Day in a Canoe on Apple iTunes. Thank you, Planning Alternatives, for having me here today with all of you at Outlook 2020. I'll also appear live on Planning Alternatives hosted webinar on February 19th. Please see planningalt.com for details.